Hi there, podcast fans. I'm Tom Gibbs. Welcome to Telegraph Audio Football Club. Today, Arsenal, still suffering the effects of Emery loss, seem to have forgotten how to play football. Not ideal when your opponents are Manchester City. We'll unpick the latest instalment of grief and sadness in North London. It's a weekend of mild surprises as Bournemouth beat Chelsea and Norwich nick a point off Leicester City. How did they manage that? And how should we rate Jamie Vardy compared to the great Premier League strikers of Christmas past? Plus, the Champions League draw, an upcoming Classico, and players you didn't realise were still earning a living from football. Let's take you now into the audio recording facility where I am joined by JJ Ball. How are you, JJ? I'm good. Um, I was in the early shift today, like a really early one, and the taxi driver's car didn't start. Oh, no. How did he get there in the first place? Poor guy. Oh, oh, yeah. Curious. Oh. A riddle, a modern riddle alongside him as ever. Mina Rizuki, what's happening, Mina? I feel like I have a permanent cold these days. I'm either coughing or sneezing or not too good in it's a It's a downbeat start to today's episode, but hopefully this man is going to bring it up a level. The always chirpy Matt Law. Uh, hello. How are you? Yeah, good. Fine. It's the whole gang. No halfway, problems. Halfway through a banana. I'm not. I'm three quarters, I'd say. Okay. I'm going to finish that off at some point. All right, good. Uh, you've opened it the wrong way, unfortunately. What do you mean I've opened it the wrong the, way? The smart way to do bananas is to open them from the uh, the non-stalky end. It's much easier to open them. If you ever see a monkey eating a banana, that's what they do. And you'll never go back once you that's start doing rubbish. that. That's rubbish. What kind no, of serial killer it. opens a banana from yeah, the exactly. That is rubbish. Try it out. Try it out. You will never go I back. I eat pies upside down. You're wrong. That's what? a good tip. Upside pies down. upside down. What? Why would you do that? Just stays together better. You I, eat from I, I the soft, like the, the bottom soft bit, and the hard bit at the bottom keeps it together. Mm. Does it not fall off the, the, yeah. Yeah, the yeah. toppings? Hold it by it. Audio Pie Club. <laughs> Let's adjust on anything that you eat differently. <laughs> <laughs> AFC podcast at telegraph.co.uk. What do you eat like a serial killer? Let's start with <laughs> Arsenal versus Manchester City. Looked like a big game. In fact, it was basically over after about two minutes. Arsenal just seemed to have completely fallen away from the top sides now, JJ. Did they ever stand a chance in this game, realistically? I mean, they. well, it's hard to say. They didn't really stand a chance. They're just such a weird team in transition at the moment. And... Do you mean the team itself is in transition the, the team or like when, when the ball is in transition, they're well, a weird team? The, the issue that they've got is they don't adjust their team appropriately to the situation they're in. It's like uh, it's that like all the players are playing individually um, and they are only worried about what happens to them rather than what happens to the team. So to the point where if someone's out of position, another wouldn't cover them. It's like, well, it's not my job, you know, because then that's what they have to do. And that sort of bit, like when, when Ozil comes off and he's all annoyed because he's not doing anything like he's supposed to, like he's supposed to be blocking the pass into a, to Rodrigo or Rodri, uh, and then he comes off and he's all annoyed. It's, well, th- there's a reason he's not doing it. And what Freddie Lundberg's trying to do isn't really clear either. And I don't know if that's because it's because the players aren't carrying it out or because uh, well, what, what I mean is Lundberg's probably doing things that make sense apart from trying to press high against City in that game. But the players aren't carrying it out the way he wants, so it looks like he's not doing very well either. But I don't know what you can do with that group of players to to sharpen them up. Yeah, they looked at Manchester City like they were playing a video game on a far too easy level for them. I thought for long periods on uh, Sunday, and in the end, they they ended up looking quite complacent to me. Like they weren't. It was almost like it was too easy for them, and they weren't being stretched enough. Arsenal, though, Mina, they look worse now than they did under Emery. They need some sort of action decisively in the manager position. You'd have thought. Yeah, but I don't, this is the thing, like, I don't understand why you would have gotten rid of Emery if you didn't have a backup plan already, like, created. I I feel like their list of who they're going to bring in and and how many people they're going to interview is just never ending. Um, There's so many people who are allowed to vote and allowed a decision on what happens that you wonder who actually is the leader of Arsenal, who are the ones who make the decisions and how long it actually takes them to make the necessary decisions. I don't know if there really is a coach. Sometimes you think, you know, you're, you're You'll have specific coaches who'll come in and just change everything and, and, and they'll make, you know, your life sort of perfect, a little bit like Mourinho at Inter, Klopp at Liverpool, you know. And they just they just keep that engine going. Antonio Conte at Chelsea. But sometimes you just um 
you feel like with this group of players, and I agree with JJ, I, I'm not even sure. And I feel like a lot of them are disillusioned. I know there's a lot being said about Mesut Ozil, and I do agree in many ways that the guy is really, like you sort of understand why Madrid let him go. You know, like he isn't always a professional when he needs to be a professional, but I do Can't feel... be trusted to toe the line on social media for the Chinese key markets, can he? <laughs> but I mean, he's allowed to make a political statement as long as he says it's his own, right? I, I, I don't. I don't seemingly no. You're not allowed to make a political statement. It endangers your earning power in China. <laughs> Apparently not. But I just feel like at the same time, I feel like he's one of those people who like who's like, I come here. I came to Arsenal because it's a big club, and I sort of look around and I'm thinking to myself, this is not what I expected. It's a bad team with bad players, and I should be in this Manchester City team trying to win trophies. Of course, you know his behaviour is not reflective of a of a great professional or anything like that. But I do think for a lot of these kids who are trying to grow up and show something, whether it's Gwen Doozy or Sarko, eventually there just comes a point where you just feel like, what's the point, right? Like, why am I going to give everything when it just seems like no one knows what's going on at Arsenal? Why are they in this position, Matt? How have they let themselves get to a point where they've sacked a manager and seemingly there's no clear path forward? Why did they sack him if there wasn't a plan? Bad ownership. I mean, they they were was trying it, to muddle. Were they panicking? <coughs> well, they were trying to muddle through to the end of the season. I think that was fairly clear. Um, they wanted to do that, and then it just got so bad, and the atmosphere got so poisonous that they felt they had to make a change to try and kind of get a bounce, which hasn't really happened. Um, I mean, the one thing Freddie Jumberg has failed in is just getting any sort of dynamism or fake bounce. You know, you can. By changing manager, Duncan Ferguson's proven at the moment, you can get a fake bounce just through passion and all that kind of thing. I mean, breaking news this morning seems to be that the Arsenal officials have been leaving Arteta's house at one twenty in the morning. The picture's been taken. It's a remarkable coincidence that a photographer was stood outside Mikel Arteta's house at one twenty in the morning. <laughs> Just Diligent ready. reporting. Yeah, finally, after four years, it's just, paid off. Just ready for some faceless men who the general public wouldn't know who they were to walk out and snap pictures of them. So it's looking very much like it's going to be Arteta at the moment. That's well, a worry, well, isn't it? It's impossible to know. I thought Arteta was a good, would have been a decent choice to replace Wenger just in the fact that they, I thought at that time, didn't have the worst squad in the world and you just needed to connect the fan base, try and get things moving a bit. It feels like a bigger job now. It feels a bit broken because Edith is gone. The people in power all seem clueless. No one wants to take responsibility. There's a lot of managing and a lot of work to be done there. But it's impossible to say whether that's a good appointment or a bad appointment because we just don't know what it's going to be like. But it, I feel like this problem started like not, not just a few years ago or not when Wenger left, but even before that when the club was systematically sort of selling some of their best players, um, not necessarily or replacing them with the right ones. I, I, I just feel like... There just came a point where, you know, you, you always looked at Arsenal as being this great team that had great leaders within it. And then it was like, OK, we'll also find bargains. And then the defence started creating problems. But at least they had an identity going forward. And then it's just gone worse every year. Well, the, the two things that I think are the, are the biggest things are the Cronky takeover has been a disaster. Mm. Um, he just doesn't yeah. really seem interested in football, quite frankly. Um but then the second thing is, and this is a big gamble that didn't pay off for them, they really put everything into the fact that FFP would one day make them kind of super champions and that they would be prepared better than any other club for FFP and naively didn't think that everyone would just cheat and get round FFP. And I think both Gazidas and Wenger have admitted this. Um, and it's killed them. It's absolutely killed them. they got good players, but... The players they have are, are really, really talented, and you look at the starting eleven against City, and there's like top, top quality there. I mean, Aubameyang is clearly there. Pepe will turn into a good player. The likes of Guendouzi could do with a, a leader next to them to try and take them to that next level, and they need coaching. And Arteta might be the one who comes in and makes them play in a similar way to City, like uh, more compact, more compressed, pressing higher, playing in a different way, so they defend by pushing further up the pitch and getting that working. But he needs a coaching team. And Lundberg's even said, I think it's today, or he came out on Sunday and said, that they're basically working on a skeleton but crew. Just I've got a massive problem with that statement because Steve Bold is still at the club. He used to be Arsene Wenger's assistant manager. He sat on a bench for years. We all used to moan that Steve Bold didn't get to do enough coaching or whatever. Mm. And Steve Bold's been completely sidelined. He's not mm. part of this... At all, but he's meant to be the defensive coach when he was. A, but he's not. He's just banger. working with the academy now. Exactly, he got, yeah, he got demoted. But now, when they've got no coaches, 
apparently there's some personal issue between him and Freddie Jumbo, but it's a bit fre- rich for Freddie Jumbo to start moaning about no coaches when the most experienced coach <coughs> of the club is actually sat doing nothing with the academy. And it sums up the club, it's a mess. But Emery took out all his all his staff went with him and he went, didn't he? So oh, again, yeah. I mean, it'd be very hard for Lundberg to put any ideas in, in his short time without a full oh, no, coaching but, staff. But this well, again begs the question, option. why make the change? Oh yeah, it, it looked to me like what Matt's saying, but it looks like brand management because he was starting to get ridiculed to the manager and like that can't be good and it would take them either, ever further down. So kill him now, then you put Lundberg in charge and you might get a super duper bounce. I, I didn't realise they killed like, Emery. That's yeah, he's excessive. dead. It's a, wow. it's a real shame. Blimey, that yeah. is a shame. Poor old. Poor he's eating old bananas old. wrong. <laughs> <laughs> I finished it. Finished it. Well done, Matt. What about Pep, Matt? Do you think this is looking like his swan song season? He's made a few comments recently. To yeah, look, I don't know. It seem like it might be. End I don't of the know. Year it might be if they win the Champions League. I just don't think Pep is ever going to get a better club now to work at the Man City. Everything is set up at that club for Pep. The owner, you know, Berigiston's there, Soriano's there, all his old mates are kind of there. The whole club is set up for Pep. It literally may as well be called Pep City. <laughs> Because everything... Just, he, kind of what I thought Arsenal was, Arsene Wenger. Yeah, I, but even more so than that, I think. Um, and he's not going to get that anywhere else. And I really think if he ends up getting a little bit bored with things or thinking it's time for a new challenge, I really think if he then... Unless he were to go into international management, he could actually regret it if he goes to another club where it's, it's never going to be the same. I mean, Pep can afford to have... He could finish fourth this season and no one's really going to ask any questions of him at City. He will be allowed to build his own new team... They will give him exactly what he wants. That's the biggest if, thing for me is building the new team because yeah. he'll he'll go to Italy. He'll he'll manage in Italy. He's played there and he says he wants to. And he'll probably go to UV and he'll win because it's easy and he'll do it. I hey, bet, hey, it's all that easy. Uh, you know it is. And then they can play. <laughs> but he can play the way he wants to play, and then it'll maybe work off the back of Sari as well. If he's changing it a bit, it might make total sense the way they've gone with Sari first. He plays a similar system to what Guardiola does. But if he. I don't know if he wants his legacy to be that he's won the league and dominated in every single country that he's gone to or whether he'd like to be like Alex Ferguson who always said he looked up to as being able to build these new these new teams that can come through and the, it looks like this cycle of the current one he's got is coming to an end he's going to have to do something in the summer I don't know what they've got with money they've obviously got money but maybe that's not the way forward they want to try and build from within and get people coming through but that's where you could do it because like you said it's completely in his image yeah. you say that but I, I do think as well like in many ways w- with Barcelona who were so desperate to keep him at the time and he had a team that was really everything that he wanted it to be he mm. had the players that he thought were smart enough to win treble after treble he was beloved by every fan every player everything you know but at the same time he also felt that there was a time when he couldn't no longer give anything and he had taken them as far as possible he has a weird personal ambition thing I don't think it's like there are two sets of coaches you're Sir Alex Ferguson and I would put like a lady and maybe Ancelotti in there who don't mind staying for like years you know and, and they actually have a like they enjoy the challenge of rebuilding and creating something new with the, with the team that they have but with others it's about reaching the very climax of like amazing management and to be that but I do think they're just, I think that for him, City was such a delicious prospect because of the fact that it didn't have the brand name that Barcelona or Bayern had. It was something unusual. He wanted to be the guy that propelled them forward in European competition. And I think what he's realizing now is that it's a much tougher ask than I thought even he thought. And now maybe he's a little bit like, oh, I don't know if I can do this much anymore. Let's talk about a couple of surprise results on Saturday. Bournemouth with their first win for a long time against Chelsea. Clever finish from Dan Gosling, the fun yeah. side of VAR, uh, <laughs> giving us a goal where it looked like uh, we weren't going to get one. Did you think they were good value for their win, Mina, at Stamford Bridge? Um, I thought they were very good, by all means. I, I thought Ramsdale in particular was excellent in his job. But I do think that this was one of those where like Chelsea have just played midweek, they're in the Champions League, they're a little bit exhausted. Um It was more a little bit like Chelsea have, you know, they are playing with a lot of youth, so you can't expect them to be consistent every three days every three days and have like this perfect creativity and taking all their chances and so perfect and I think when it came to Bournemouth they worked as a team they realized that they have an, a, a potential to win this match if they worked hard and it went their way but again I'm, I'm you know they do have nine injuries so it's amazing that they managed the result but I don't watch them and think to myself 
oh my God, they're such a great playing team. But then why would you expect that with nine injuries? That young core Chelsea have got, JJ, have any of them gone off the boil a little bit in recent weeks, do you think? Uh, it's an interesting one. So I went, I went through the Bournemouth game this, this morning for a piece I've written on, on Chelsea and the same problems that we pointed out in this podcast, even in a piece I wrote earlier in the year, are still there. The, the way that Lampard has them is their, their build-up shape leads to them being hit on the counter so easily every single time. And there's Jorginho was alone trying to protect two centre-backs. And although, they, I mean, Bournemouth didn't score from that. It was from a set piece that they, you know, that happened. But uh, again, like Mina's saying, maybe it's just worn down from Champions League games constantly playing. Mason Mount came in. But they're not helping themselves in transition and they're always hurt that way. And it means that if they go forward and they can't score, they, they get punted up the other end and mm. they concede. And that's exactly how West Ham did them in. It's uh, exactly how Man United did it at the start of the season. And you saw it here. Not every team's got players good enough to take advantage of it. And because they throw so many forwards, it means they're really dangerous in attack and they always get overloads and can score that way, which they tried against Bournemouth. But then, I mean, the, in the first five minutes, Bournemouth had a couple of counters on them that they could easily have scored from. So although they didn't win by that method, I think it's relevant to the game and how Chelsea are playing and also to how Lampard's derby were. By playing that way, they'll win some games, but they'll lose the occasional ones, especially against teams like this, because it's kind of inconsistent. There's no control of it. It's like he, his team isn't rigidly... Like Sarri's team, right? It was all based on positional play. So everyone had to be in a certain place at a certain time, specifically for transition. So if they lost the ball, they could win it back because everyone's in, in the right place. But if you watch any Chelsea game, you'll notice that Kante goes wandering around, uh, William drops from right wing into midfield to try and take the ball. This is quite smart when you're trying to build from the back because it means you've got someone in space where the opposition doesn't expect them so they can fire it through. But as soon as that ball's turned over, you're not covered in other positions and that's where they're getting hurt every single time. It's weird. They don't have any control in midfield. And and I thought that it was a great point in match of the day when they were like trying to show you from the back where Rudiger, for example, or wasn't actually passing it to Jorginho because these are the matches where sometimes you need to just control possession, just hold the ball, uh, try to, you know, like take the sting out of the game and, and show like your maturity on this occasion. But I think with Chelsea, what's un what they have under Lampard is this very offensive mentality and it's like trying to find the ball going forward and then you lose the ball and it's chaos. And so, so I think this is where sometimes you need to just take a breather. They are exhausted and they play very exhaustive tactics in the sense of always outscoring the opponent. That's end-to-end -end every yeah. game. It's really fun to watch. So it's, it's, yeah, it but it's quite sport. hard to keep up as well. Match of the day analysis was really good on the centre-backs. They, mm. they can't play. Those two centre-backs, I don't think, can play together, Rüdiger and Zuma. They're too similar. Um, neither of them are very good on the ball. They're both kind of very good and physical and quite quick and good tacklers, but they can't pass. And Rüdiger was good last season having David Luiz next to him because he just gave it to Luiz and Luiz would ping just the ball around. Just give it around. to Jorginho. You don't even need to But they, they, they don't seem to even be able to do that. Um, and that's a real problem because Eddie Howe was really smart and just let the centre-backs have the ball. Mm. And they're going to also find the, the problem that Sari found if they have those two centre-backs playing is that, as you say with Jorginho, then it just becomes just Mark Jorginho every time yeah, and then let those two have the ball and they can't do anything. You'd expect some transfer market fund from them in January uh, now. Matt, who, who are they going to be after? I'd be amazed. I mean, it's such a cliche, but Ake just seems like a no-brainer for them because they've got this buyback clause. They can get him about half his market value um, and he can play on the ball and he can fill in in lots of different positions. Um, you don't think an old soul may be required? I don't think they'll go that way, no. I don't. I just don't see them doing that. And then some sort of forward, but that's really difficult. I wrote a piece in the week that I think they're going to have a similar problem to Tottenham with Kane on strikers because you, what kind of striker do you go for? Do you, do you go for someone who's immediately going to relegate Tammy Abraham? No. Then you're asking people to be back up for Tammy Abraham because he's only probably going to ever play one up front difficult. So then you're looking for a guy who can sort of play wide forward, which is why Zaha keeps getting mentioned. He's got two goals this season. So really difficult, really, really difficult for them. Mm. Another great result was Norwich, who earned a draw at Leicester City. Much better from Norwich, who've been uh, falling away a little bit generally after a good start. If only Timo Pukki had a little bit more pace, JJ, but no such issues for Jamie Vardy. Uh, his, his goal didn't count in the end on Saturday, but what an amazing spell he's having. I was thinking about Vardy. He must be pushing now for inclusion as like one of the top 10 Premier League strikers ever. Is that, is that a crazy thing to say, JJ, or have I got a, a good argument there? It's not crazy. And I read that, I was thinking, trying to think who the other ones were, but mm. you'd probably put him, is he better than Solskjaer was? Yes. 
Yeah, he is. I think so. Yeah, yeah. 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 And it's 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 now been a long spell. It's a big body. He's of nearly a hundred Premier League goals, isn't he? It's not that many who have got it. I'm just actually trying to Google it as I talk to you. <laughs> but um, he, he's only about nine, nine or ten off, something like that. And I mean, that is a huge. Considering how late he came into the game to get 100 Premier League goals, that the rate he scored that in is incredible. Absolutely perfect for how Rodgers plays as well. And you think of his past teams, that Liverpool, you had Suarez led the press. That's what Jimmy Vardy does now. Uh, Swansea, not quite as talented. Danny, Danny Graham is the boy at the top who did that. Um, Celtic didn't have a similar player, but they, Vardy playing off the top of that for Leicester works really well for Vardy and for the way Rodgers wants to play. And it's kind of interesting that Rodgers has changed his shape a little bit to try and get Ihinacho in the team. I think that's specifically why he's done it, going to a diamond. Norwich managed to get a draw out of it. I mean, I think Leicester would, would have won that if they played a few more games in a row. But uh, Rodgers changing his style halfway through after it's been working so well in the 4-1, 4-1. So that could be something that... I don't know. It's, it's good. Maybe it's good to change it up. I mean, Keep an eye on it. Didier Can Drogba, we... who similarly was a latecomer, ended up with 104 Premier League goals. Vardy's going to get more than that. Mm. So you've got to say he is one of the best. Can we give a bit of love to Buendia? I mean, yes, I please. feel like when he's uh, when he's in top form and Timo Puki just they understand each other so well. And when those two aren't, you know, like at their highest level, then you find like Norwich has so many problems. But defensively, I thought they were so much better as well because that's where I really I'm always like, oh my god, this is so terrible. But they, they really raised their game sometimes against the big opponents. They raised it uh, obviously over the weekend against Manchester City. They are, I don't know, maybe they're getting better. When Dia is the fifth most creative player in the league this wow. season. He's created 41 chances. In a list you've just made up. No. <laughs> <laughs> I thought that was true. It is true. It oh, is. okay. It's De, De Bruyne, Alexander-Arnold, Madison, uh, Dina are the only players above him. Hello, football fans. My name's Danny Boyle, and I'm the Telegraph's Commuter Editions editor, which means it's my job to provide you with great journalism that makes your journey to and from work as enjoyable as possible. I can't prevent train delays or guarantee you won't get caught in the rain, but I can make sure you're up to date with the best of the Telegraph every morning and evening. My colleague Chris Price and I produce briefings to bring you up to speed in just two minutes at both ends of the day. Now, they're also available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify or wherever you listen to your podcasts. Just search The Briefing or follow the link in the show notes to this episode. Let's rattle through the rest of the Premier League now. New contract for Jurgen Klopp. More of the same from his team at the weekend. Winning without playing all that well. Very sloppy against Watford and defensively quite open as well, I thought. Um, but l- l- we'll talk about Liverpool. It's been much the same for many weeks now. Let's have a quick word for Watford. Pretty good in Nigel Pearson's first game, Matt. Um, have they got enough about them to pull themselves together, do you think? No. It's not a terrible 11. You look through. No, it's not a terrible 11, but they're so and far they behind well. now that they're. they're they're playing some decent games and not really picking up any points. Um, and you just look at the fixtures. They've got such a... They're coming from so far behind now. That is really, really difficult. Um, and, you know, Nigel Pearson. I, funny I just appointment. Think they need to have... It is a strange one. I mean, he had a nightmare at Derby. Everyone keeps talking about, oh, Nigel Pearson, he, he, was, uh, he set the ball rolling for Leicester. That was a really long time ago. He had a nightmare at Derby and he got sacked by a Belgian second division club. Um <laughs> That's his most late. That's his latest body of work. I can only see relegation for him. Do they get any extra points for what a nice man Ben Foster is? Yes, for sure. What a story that is. Are talk, you all aware of this? Talk us through it. Yeah, Matt. tell us the story. So apparently, after the Crystal Palace game, um, Ben Foster is driving home with his wife or girlfriend. I don't know whether, it, or his wife and girlfriend, maybe. maybe. Both. Yeah. <laughs> um, and sees a sort of old man um, wandering along who eventually collapses in a ditch. And it turns out that this old guy was an 80-year-old guy whose car wouldn't start, took it upon himself to try and start walking home and ended up falling into a ditch and could have been, you know, really bad and really sad story. And uh, Foster stops, helps him, gets him in his car, not only gets him home, but invites him around for Christmas dinner and sorts him out with a season ticket for next season. What a story at this time of year. Can I just say, I'm sure this is right, and I'm sure Ben Foster is a wonderful man, but isn't it strange that when something is posted on social media as a screen grab, everyone's like, well, that's got to be true. Do we have any evidence for this story? (laughs) Watford Watford did tweet out about it. Watford have backed it up, yeah. Well, they would, wouldn't they? 
And well, I, I doubt whether they can back it up if it's a lie. <laughs> oh, yeah, this happened. No one's no, ever no, going to find out that this is a massive lie. Yeah, but you have, have you never retweeted stuff on Twitter because you know, like, oh, someone's tweeted it? You don't actually think, oh, I better check this. What Maybe they didn't did retweet the it. They did a separate kind of story. I'm sure I'm sure it's right. I'm just playing devil's advocate <laughs> stroke. Awful Come human on, being. Ben Foster. And that great old man the Grinch. was Kevin Keegan. <laughs> 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 uh, speaking of Jurgen Klopp's contract, have you noticed that Steven Gerrard's new contract at Rangers expires at exactly the same time as Jurgen oh, Klopp's does? Okay. Oh. Okay, you've blown the whole thing wide open. <laughs> yeah, that's what's So now happen. we know who's the next one. It's been lined up for ages, isn't it? <laughs> Sheffield United, excellent. Again, making it look easy, Mina. Uh, what can other promoted teams learn from how they've gone about this season? You can't. You can't create Chris Wilder again. I think that that's he's... I mean, I know that we speak a lot about English coaches who are like, you know, really doing something special. Eddie Howe, obviously, did a, you know, is doing a great job at Bournemouth, whatever. But Chris Wilder is something on another level. I really feel like the, the, how he has fostered a great environment in the dressing room, how he seems to appeal to all his players who are willing to, you know, do anything that he asks of them. I think they're always a little bit better after the break. So the first half, they're always quite good. And I thought they were very good against Villa. But then against the second half, it's like they totally dominate after that. And I don't know what he says at halftime to get these guys so obsessed with getting the win. But it's a well-balanced team as well. I think that what they have in him is a man that they can come to, but at the same time, a disciplinarian who's not willing to put put up with anything unless it's the very best he also doesn't speak to them like they're a newly promoted team he speaks to them like he's demanding something from them no I need this I want this this is not good enough it's not like oh well this is good and it's good we just you know took part in this match it's like no I'm demanding the very best and I think that's changed the psychology of the team I honestly think he's a wonderful coach probably the best that we have right now remember when Alan Pardew won manager of the year by getting Newcastle up to similar sort of bit no Wilder's different there It'll be a bit like in Scooby Doo. I mean, they take look, off Wilder's mask. Graham Potter's doing a really good job, but Wilder's just that also much Wilder. Better. To be fair, Wilder's has done it at other clubs as well, hasn't yeah. he? It's not like he's just got something going at Sheffield United. Yeah, and amazing, he'll have a amazing go. The improvement in the players he's got is what is, I think how you know he's a really good coach. You yes. can see players like John Fleck and Oliver Norwood are, and Musi this season as well. You can see that in fact, every single player in there is much better than they should be. And that's the mark of a good coach. And they're having confidence to do back heels. You know, like this is just, you know, it's. It, they feel happy to be where they are and willing to try anything. What about Spurs, JJ? Late win at Wolves. This is how it always starts under Jose Mourinho. Big uptick in results and performances. Are they doing anything unexpected at the moment to get these results? Uh, nothing unexpected that I can see. Uh, the, the, I mean, the plus point for Spurs fans is that Mourinho's got them to win, was it two away games now? And Prochino couldn't barely get close to that during his time there. Uh, they're playing exactly the way you'd imagine Mourinho team would. They... They block where you think they would, and they hit them in transition. I think I'm, I'm a little surprised that Harry Kane hasn't scored more or been more of a, the player that he has been in previous seasons yet. But maybe that's coming. Deli Ali's been great since he came back in. Lucas Moura. In fact, the only surprise this is one surprising thing is that Lucas Moura is still playing on the right rather than Sissoko. I thought he'd go with a more defensive kind of player in that bit, especially because the, the, the wide forwards are where he tends to be really defensive. But so far, it's just. The same Spurs I thought as there was one um, one really noticeable difference between a Pochettino team and a Mourinho team at the weekend. That's what the way everyone started taking out Adama Traore. Yeah, <laughs> when things got difficult against Twen- Wolves, is it it's something like twenty four different players have been booked for fouls on him this season? Yeah. Really, so and there were about well. there was a spell of about twenty minutes when it seemed like three or four Spurs players. It's a got great, booked. it's a great little Premier League mini game, isn't it? Like how many different players can foul Traore um, throughout the season? But I don't think po- po- Pochettino did used to sort of moan or talk about the fact that his team were a little bit naive um, and wouldn't get involved in the dark arts and he used to try and make them and someone like Lamella would um, they, they used to all the time they used to hack everyone at halfway That's what I'd, Spurs were quite frustrating to I, watch a lot I of the haven't time. seen I haven't seen it like that though when one player's threatening to take them over and then they all just literally pile into him like they did with I thought that was like pure Mourinho <laughs> What about big Duncan Ferguson? Matt <laughs> doesn't need a coat in the rain at Old Trafford, just needs a trusty Everton sweatband. He's clearly really inspiring, that team. Is it just a case of what you're I saying there about a fake bounce? You did call I it. I called Matt. it. Mm. Put in big dunk and you'll get a bounce. Mm. Um, yeah, I don't know what he's doing. It's, it's just it's probably not a long-term option for them, passion. but it's, it's quite fun to watch. Well, I think the, the fact that what he did to Moyes Keane is probably a, a great indicator of the fact it's not a long-term option. Because <laughs> while... You can understand why he did that for one match. You, I don't think you can actually manage like that going forward. So I felt quite sorry for Moyes Keane. Oh, no, I thought that was such a disaster. Like, I just imagine 
But that's that's a coach who, in fairness to Ferguson, Ferguson's only remit at the moment is to get them through game by game. He doesn't have to think about long term or Which consequences. You don't, have to. you don't really. You honestly take the guy off. Like so, I don't have a problem with that. But turn around and see, look at him. Yeah, or give him a cuddle or something. Something that um, just you don't ruin the, a nineteen year old. But it was pure sort of one one game management, wasn't it? Which is is fine. But I thought it showed that you can't. Doesn't go he want the job long term? I think he probably knows there's just no chance that's going to happen. He's more or less said that he said, well, there's a quote today that he that Everton need a world-class manager and he hasn't got the experience yet. Yeah, I I'd, I'd think he'd just try and be part of whatever the next setup is. Yes, fair enough, Big Dunk. We've enjoyed it, whatever happens. <laughs> Breaking news now. We have a Champions League. Last 16 Woo-hoo. draw. Mina Rizuki is dancing with happiness. Let's take you I through it. I don't understand people who get excited by draws. Oh well, my God, I get so excited. You can have this out after Some teams the play the some other teams. <laughs> anyway, here we go. We'll do the English this teams This is a Villa first. fan. <laughs> I don't, I'm not excited when it's a draw involving Villa either. Silence, please. It's a Champions League draw. Real Madrid play Manchester City. Atletico Madrid play Liverpool. Chelsea have Bayern Munich. Tottenham have the uh, Leipzig Red Bull organisation. Uh, and elsewhere, Borussia Dortmund, PSG, Atalanta, Valencia, Lyon, Juve and Napoli, Barcelona. Which of those stands out to you all? Firstly, can I just say something? For the first time, I think, in like 14 years, Paris Saint-Germain has actually gotten a tie that they can get through with relative ease. Yes. <laughs> I think I think that it's been like they've always had the hardest tie. And this time around, I feel like it's not that Dortmund are rollovers, but, you know, it's going to be easy to defeat them. But it's going to be a lot easier to defeat them than some of the big sides in, in the likes of uh, Barcelona or Liverpool or whomever. Or they wouldn't have gotten City football. Madrid is quite box office, isn't it? Do you think that's uh, going to be... Is it a good time to be playing Real Madrid for Man City or...? No. I feel like Madrid has grown so much in the last month, really. And I think that what you find is by the time they hit February, they hit their stride. Zidane is really getting the best out of the kids. Um, the likes of Rodrigo up front, uh, Federico Valverde in the middle is sensational if you're talking about midfielders. Um, I feel like he knows how to foster a, a great harmony in the dressing room. He is a great man manager. By then, I assume Gareth Bale will be, you know, back to playing a lot more regularly. Um, again, the difference maker that you can rely on, Hazard would be, uh, by then, you would hope as well, much better than what he is now. I think that considering what they can do going forward, considering Karim Benzema's form currently and Man City's defensive problems, I don't know whether they can resolve that by then. They will have Laporte back, so that's going to be interesting to see. Um, but I, I do think just experience versus a team that might just be a little bit intimidated by the name of Madrid considering their inexperience in this competition. Which of those games do you hope you're sent to, Matt? <sighs> I'm going to be sent to Bayern Munich, Chelsea, and it's going to be... Chelsea could do something, you know. I'm just going to have to write so many pieces about Frank Lampard in Munich and winning the Champions League in 2012. Yawn. You know, I, I apologise. There's a man who loves his job. <laughs> yeah. I hate writing about the past. I, I apologise to everyone who has to read my pieces about <laughs> that. In which the English teams? Games. Which English teams can go through? Give Nap- everyone a history Liverpool? lesson. Napoli, Barcelona should be exciting. Yeah. You, you, someone, someone tell me because all the I'm looking at Twitter and all the Spurs fans are celebrating it in Leipzig, and I think that's maybe naive. Yeah, I'd say so too. No, I don't think so. Who's no. going to win it? I all, think Georgia? Spurs will win it. The whole thing? Yeah. Uh, Atalanta, Valencia. You feel like Atalanta could actually do this, by the way. Yeah. They could actually reach the quarterfinals. Why not? Why not? I think Liverpool or Real Madrid. Real Madrid okay. just because of the, the players who have won it before. <clears throat> well, you've like, got Leon. I mean, no. Yeah. And Ronaldo. Yeah. Yeah. No. Anyone can. <laughs> it's a cup competition. You can just get lucky. Exactly, yeah. It's Very quite true. the joy of cup competitions. Yeah. Much like Chelsea in Munich. Exactly. Yeah, which we'll be hearing plenty more no. about. Maybe it's God. PSG. Do you think it's PSG's turn, finally? Probably not. Let's have some lovely <laughs> music. <laughs> yep, it's a song for Europe. Mina Gennaro Gattuso is back into our lives at Napoli. Quite a shift from Ancelotti. Uh, what's the reaction been like to his appointment? I think there's a lot of uh, sort of sadness about Carlo Ancelotti and the way that he was, uh, you know, managed to do such amazing work in Europe and then sacked. Unfortunately, the way that it was going for him in Serie A, uh, I think that in terms of just running the club as a business, it wasn't the right move to make because he is on nine million. So you think, oh, if we're not going to make top four, then let's go for a cheap option in Gattuso. But there's just a... L- 
I think that what it is with Napoli is that ever since they had the, that retiro, which is the training camp that the president ordered by bypassing Carlo Ancelotti, not asking for his opinion, there's just been this mutiny uh, at the dressing room level. That some players have been feeling very disillusioned and feeling like uh, the club hasn't been grateful to everything that they've been given. They're not exactly paid huge wages at Napoli. Their image rights belong to the club. Um, and, you know, and they've been day in, day out sort of overachieving considering how much money is spent on the team. And it's nowhere near what Inter or Juventus or other big teams in Italy do do. Um, so I think that right now, you know, some of their contracts not being extended, the likes of Callejon, for example, Dries Mertens, we don't know what's going to go on with that. So they're just a little bit like, you know what, why should we try? And then now they are trying to try. It's it's a little bit too late because you can't just switch it back on all of a sudden. I think Gattuso thought that it would be an easier task and he realized straight away after that loss to Parma, who aren't exactly a spectacular team, but a very good counterattacking one. And when he saw the problems within his side, he's realized that, it's not a case of changing coach. You need a psychiatrist at that club right now. <laughs> Meanwhile, in Deutschland, Bayern Munich back with a 6-1 victory over Werder Bremen. Coutinho with a hat-trick. Is he finding his feet a little bit now in Germany? Mm, yeah, he didn't uh, find his feet in the first three months, but this was certainly a game in which he uh, turned it all on. He was phenomenal, really. Um, it took him a while to get there, and I just feel like it's not really his fault, and I'm not entirely sure that he's going to remain consistent either. Um, you know, with the change in coach, the change of tactics, I think that Bayern are not necessarily making the most of their domination, especially last week against Munchen Gladbach, for example, um, where they dominated the game in, in, in huge, you know, in huge gaps, and then they just fought, all of a sudden lost that match. Um, but he really was exceptional. You know he is when, when he has that moment and he got a hat-trick, he assisted two goals, he just changed the game entirely. Um, and I thought that what was good about what happened was that they changed from the 4-3-3 where they had Leon Goretzka acting as the attacking midfielder, changed that up, and all of a sudden you saw Bayern being Bayern and um, Werder Bremen sort of release the handbrake. Still, though, I'm not entirely sure that I would be paying $100 million. I need to see a lot more. Mm. And it's three arranged Classico on Wednesday night. No, it's so exciting. So, <laughs> Who are you backing? I don't know because I feel like right now they're exactly on par. Where is it, so, Madrid? So it's going to be in Camp Nou. Okay. Uh, so in Barcelona. And and you just feel like, oh, you know, obviously there's Messi and that's the difference maker. But at the same time, Karim Benzema is just in this wild form. I think he's, he's basically matching Messi's statistics, uh, except one assist less, I think. And... They, you know, there's just this, you know, little Barcelona, always Barcelona, always scary, especially when they're playing at home. But if you saw that game against Valencia and it was really a last minute victory for Real Madrid with uh, Benzema getting it. But Courtois was going up and he nearly scored the goal that led to Benzema getting the equaliser. And you feel like they're so desperate to do something special. But Barcelona will be desperate not to lose as well. So I don't know. It's going to be exciting because I honestly think going into this, they're both in exactly the same place and exactly sort of experiencing the same level of form or whatever whatever it is you would say. But I don't know. It's a pleasing novelty to have a Christmas Classico. It's like the Christmas <laughs> election, except actually fun. Except fun. Uh, and I'll leave it there on the election. Let's finish <laughs> off with a question we put to our friends on social media, which is as follows. After former Swansea City striker, Bafatimbi Gomi scored the winner for Al Halal to reach the FIFA Club World Cup semi-finals. When was the last time you had a, huh, I didn't realise you were still playing moment. And we had lots of replies to this when Kyan says Leighton Baines when he was warming up against Leicester City. Patrick says Phil Bardsley for Burnley and Vatsan says Javinho playing for Palmer. What have you got, JJ? That's a good one. Uh, I always I remember when I saw Clash and Hantler playing for Ajax again. I was like, all right, he's still going. That's a good one. Um, but even players that just go missing and you forget they exist. Like John Fleck turned up at Sheffield United this year for me. And I'm like, what? When I remember him at, when he was uh, coming through the youth. James McCarthy went to Crystal Palace. Where did he come from? I remember him playing for Hamilton back in the day. But then I play a game with my friends quite a lot where you just text them the name of a 90s footballer that you've forgotten about, like the game. You know, that, you know the game? Like Didier, <laughs> Didier Domi. You know? then, Very well played. What, last what's the game? What, what does the other person have to do? Well, they, you, you win if they haven't thought of that person ever, really, since you... Mention it. How do you know John they're not Harrison? lying? There's a but, lot of honesty. Because you just know. <laughs> you just know. Okay. Nina, who have you got? Emmanuel Adebayo. Oh. Who's uh -huh. he playing for? Well, I think a he's Turkish still playing club, for them. Yeah, but he was 
I mean, he plays. He played for Kayseri Spor, who had financial problems, and apparently he announced that that was the last game for them when they lost to Besiktas. Um, but when I saw him, like, as in when everyone was talking about the financial problems surrounding this Turkish club, I'm like, oh, that's a man who had to buy all. <laughs> like, for me, I'd forgotten about what was going on with him. Yeah, still very much alive. Complete the podcast, Matt Law. I had one last week, David Nugent, oh. who scored a winner for Preston North End, which was his first Preston goal since, like, Tony Blair was in power or something. So, yeah, complete. And, and didn't he nick an England goal? Yeah, once? he's got one very, very cheeky. He just goal. Like, put it in on the goal line. But he, he must be like 45 by now, David Nugent. Yeah. I, I mean, let's not fact check that, but that sounds about right. Yeah, sure. <laughs> he would also play the game. That's it all for this week. You can contact me on Twitter if you'd like to before next week's episode. It's at Tom with an H Gibbs. Our festive schedule is straightforward. We're just going to be with you for the next two Mondays. The fixtures fall very kindly this year, so look out for Audio Football Club. Just because you're not at work doesn't mean you can stop listening. Send us an email if you like. AFC Podcast at telegraph.co.uk is the address. We'll read out the best of what you send us. Don't forget to subscribe to Audio Football Club. You know how to subscribe to a podcast now. It's 2019. You're a person of means and intelligence backing you. Thanks to Joel Grove on the buttons and thanks to you for your company. I'll talk to you again soon. 